So the final part of the uh, the encounter, Matt says, now, Sean, I've asked for permission to go to another great hall of learning. And it's a place where beings are being prepared for entry into totally different dimensions, non-physical dimensions, which are just as real as our physical dimensions, to learn something from there. Matt, what do you see there? Sean, a very different energy in this group, much more diverse. There are beings here who have volunteered for and been many times before on other dimensions which are less exacting than Earth and beings who have volunteered for and previously been part of dimensions which are almost unimaginably beyond Earth issues. And for the moment, and for a moment in time, they are sharing a common period to get together to prepare. There are lots of mentors in this place. Matt, is there a reason you're here? Sean, yeah, just to educate myself, just to realize how extraordinarily vast and unimaginable God's imagination is. And for the initial meeting, it feels like there's going to be a meeting of all this group together. And then they're going to separate into two distinct groups. But for the moment, there is a coordinator figure here. And all the minds are connected once more so that information is being exchanged, almost like neuronal synapses. Every part is benefiting from every other part. And the message that's coming through is that this is God's game. And there is no part of this game more important than any other part of it. And that the elegance and the complexity are not measures of importance, but just of difference and creativity. And that those beings who are volunteering for dimensions which are rather simple and straightforward are no less important than those volunteering for unimaginably complex projects. And each of these beings in this hall gets that at the core. This isn't just a pretend teaching. This is the reality. And having understood that and fully ensouling that, they are now free to break up into two groups. And I've asked for permission to go into the group that is volunteering for dimensions which are complex and really, really creative to see if I can learn. Matt, what are you experiencing as you listen? Sean, the first thing I'm learning is that if it can be imagined, it's real. And if it can be remembered, it's happened. And if it hasn't been imagined, it will be imagined. And I'm hearing that sometimes these dimensions intersect. And unfortunately, talking from an earth space, we tend to unpack these kinds of anomalous experiences in mundane categories that we think we can handle and therefore explain away. And if we had the courage to dream it differently, our journeys here could be really accelerated that there would be much more assistance available and much more mentoring. And that we wouldn't dismiss any stray thought or wild imagining. And there is great excitement now in this group, now that they have been separated. And I recognize one or two souls who have been on planet Earth a few times and now are volunteering for this new kind of mission and lots of others who volunteered here many times. Matt, 
Anything else? Sean, and I realize again that the ultimate ground of all that is is so creative and imaginative and unlimitable that it's an invitation to us. Part of the reason I'm in this particular chamber is to get it really from another angle that it would be so foolish to think that any earthly institution has a kind of a monopoly on truth. Matt, it would be foolish? Sean, yeah. I mean, I can see it on planet Earth. There are so many contending claimants already for ultimate truth. And they can't all be right. Only one can be right. But then, when you have the privilege of attending an interdimensional encounter like this, you get it that any claim by any group to the ultimate is absolutely ludicrous. Matt, truth can't be contained. Sean, it doesn't even enter into the realm of thinking that it could be contained. It's not even like that it is combating containment or railing against limits. It doesn't even enter into this model. Matt, this group is important in terms of? Sean, it's kindergarten compared to grad school. Matt, what do you mean? Sean, I'm getting that although this group is wrestling with extraordinary creative and complex possibility, that they too are in awe at the courage of people who accept incarnation on planet Earth with its density of spacesuit and its limited mental capacities. That they are genuinely, that they genuinely have a sense of awe for that level of courage. Matt, anything else? Sean, it dissolves once again the notion of hierarchy, our relative importance. All these are kind of made up distinctions. Matt, anything you want to say to them? Sean, we have a saying in Swahili, when somebody is going off on a journey, even if you have no idea where, you've, you've never been where they're going, but we say to them, greet the people in that place for me. So that's what I want to say to them. Greet for me the reality in that dimension. Matt, anything else? Sean, yeah, it feels like the last or penultimate thing I need to do is to go back to my soul group, to those who are not part of my present incarnation, but are part of my soul group. My great-grandmother and my grandfather and my sister Ethna, those three. The sense I'm getting from Ethna, who died 11 years ago, and who continues to grow and evolve and learn and study, is that she hasn't incarnated yet, and in a sense, is still shepherding her three little kids whom she left behind, and won't be back on the planet for a few years. And my sense of my great-grandmother and my grandfather is that they are back, but not in my life. And that my great-grandmother is incarnated in a different religious system, totally different from Catholicism. Matt, your great-grandmother? Sean, yeah. And that she's being a mystic within that system as much as she was a mystic within Catholicism. And that my grandfather is doing what he does best, which is being a kind of a pagan, in the very best sense of pagan. The integrity and the courage to be himself and not need organizational structure to find out who he is. Matt, anything else? Sean, so 
if I were to try to sum up what the three of them are saying to me, it would be like Ethna saying to me, finish each task, whatever you signed up for, complete it. And my great grandmother saying to me, whatever community you find yourself part of, identify the mystical core of it. And my grandfather is saying to me, whatever situation you find yourself in, have the integrity to stand apart from it and challenge what is not of value in it. Matt, anything else? Sean, yeah, one last thing. I get the sense that I can choose to identify at any level and the farthest from source the emanation is, the more separated the sense of identity becomes. And so if I have a level of consciousness only as Sean, I am separated from, from 6.5 billion people right on this little planet. If I bring my level of awareness and consciousness up to the soul level, then there is a totally different kind of relationship to all other souls. And if I can manage to let go even of the soul and the illusion of the soul, because soul is the final illusion, then there is only God. And the higher up the ladder of identification I can move, the more a unifying force I can become, and the less separation I will feel. And the more I can become a teacher. And I realize that it can be ego or Sean claiming higher identification, because Sean has to disappear. And identity and ego have to dissolve before the other identity can be meaningful. Otherwise, they're just mental constructs. So to truly know I'm a soul, it can't be Sean making that statement, even if Sean is the mouthpiece for it to become audible. And so I realize, I realize that I need genuinely A mystical experience cannot be had by Sean, but Sean can be had by it. There was an old bushman in the Kalahari Desert one time who said, there is a dream dreaming us. And when we think we are the dream, we get all discombobulated. When we think we are dreaming the dream, we get inflated. But when I truly know, when I truly know that there is that there is a God dreaming, then I am fully free. Matt, what practices are helping you? Sean, I think what's helped me on the journey so far has been the time spent in meditation or in the forest or the time just spent trying to witness my own personality quirks or my failings or screw-ups, witnessing them without any self-condemnation involved, just watching what arises and what happens. Matt, do you feel complete? Sean, yeah, it's completed. I have a sense that what I came to do, I have done. So David's question was, was I surprised, surprised by what I found in that event, even though it was 18 years ago? Um, I was hugely surprised, David, because, you know, I'm going in with the previous cosmology in place. Uh, and although I had been bucking the system on a regular basis during my time in Kenya and in the, in the United States, um, that there was a huge rethink. And for me, I was surprised at the, um, 
at the intensity and the veracity, you know, of the experience, that this wasn't something, even with my imagination, there's no way I could have made up this stuff, you know, that this was happening and I was witnessing it. And that while I could interact in some way and there was telepathic exchanges between the various peoples involved, there's not a chance in hell I could have orchestrated this, you know, or pre-planned it. And so at every stage, you know, I'm just bathing in what's in what is happening to me, you know, and in the extraordinary learnings I'm having and the um, even the pithy articulations of the insights that came by. It was like they were channeled. Uh, so it's like Sean couldn't take any credit for this experience or any credit for the insights that arrived during this experience. And so in that sense, I'm, I'm blown out of the water by what, what happened. And the result is that for 18 years subsequently, that this one event, I think, among all the experiences of my life, you know, and at that stage, you know, I'm uh, one of my 58, 59 years of age, you know, at that stage, you know, I had, um, I'd been pushing the envelope and I'd been studying and meditating and stuff like that and co recording my dreams since 1979. But none of it prepared me for the kind of the intensity and, as I say, the kind of uh, the veracity of the information being transmitted. So, yeah, so it was, um, and it has hugely informed everything I've done as a priest and a psychologist and as a um, as a friend uh, subsequently. Yeah. yeah. So Francine's comment is exactly, you know, that uh, um, you can't have a mystical experience, you can be had by a mystical experience. And so it's a question of just creating the context in which spirit can speak. So I, I like to differentiate between prayer and meditation in the sense that uh, when I think of God, I think of two aspects, the transcendent, the utterly ineffable, but that which can be experienced. You can experience the in ineffable, but you can't articulate it. It's beyond words. You know, and then there's the immanence of God. God, as she reveals herself through the phenomenological realms, through everything that can be kind of seen and tasted and touched in the, in the cosmos. And that for me, prayer is the immanence of God addressing the transcendence of God. And meditation is the transcendence of God making contact with the immanence of God. And so the mystical experiences cannot be initiated from here. All you can do is try to create a, a context or a meditative situation in which the transcendence of God can dialogue with and communicate with the immanence of God through a person or through through an event. So very, very true that, you know, you can't claim to have a mystical experience. You can only uh, kind of count your lucky cards that you're in such a, a kind of a mindset that the uh, mystical experience can have you and can walk its wonders through you. But you can't take any credit whatsoever for them. And Hinduism is very, very clear on this. They talk about the siddhis, that, you know, people who are committed to the evolutionary mystical tra tra trajectory, that they may experience all kinds of psychic gifts. They call them siddhis. And the warning again and again is, do not be distracted by the siddhis. The siddhis are not the objective. The objective is union with source. And to get distracted by psychic abilities or kind of a, a kind of experiences you've had is to try to claim credit at an egoic level for something which is being gifted completely to you, over which you have no control, and in some senses, as a human being, have no right to. Uh, you only have that right because you're God expressing and articulating and communicating with herself. So there's two fo two great questions folded into that end. The first one is this sense of nostalgia for home and longing to go home. And the second part is when you go when you go back home, yeah, uh, can you then decide to stay at home and not incarnate uh, subsequently? So I believe that um, if for every incarnation, a part of the precon part of the preconception contract is that the the mentors arrange three or four possible exit uh, strategies uh, for ending a particular incarnation. You know, but the soul gets to decide which of the exits to take. It is not the ego or the incarnate itself that gets to determine, okay, I'm going to take this off, off ramp. The soul and the mentor are looking at how well have I kind of fulfilled my mission on the planet this time around? And uh, if I were to leave now, would it be with a sense that I've finished what I've come to do or that there's lots of work I didn't do that I signed up to do? So the it is the soul and the mentor at the other side who determine, okay, we're not going to take this off ramp. 
you know, keep going and see if you can make some more progress in this incarnation. And then the next off ramp, you know, suggests itself. And again, the decision is going to be made by the soul and the mentors. Okay, either you've done what you've come to do and you can take this exit, or, you know, we'd like you to keep going for a little bit and see if you can kind of uh, push the kind of the ball down the field a little bit. And so there are many exit strategies into it. But um, it, when you're serious about the journey, there's always this nostalgia. Every love, every love song that's ever been composed is a love song for God. And that with them, who I think it's a love song for my country of origin or a love song for the person I'm attracted to. You know, it's a disguised way of kind of dealing with the nostalgia we all feel for home because we belong, we belong there. So every every love song is a, a nostalgia for home. And look, so of course, as you become more aware you know, of the journey, um, you begin to realize that every experience of nostalgia, you know, I've left Ireland, I've been out of Ireland since 1972. There's the kind of a longing for the kind of the old side, you know, or there's a longing for people whom I knew in Kenya, or there's a longing, you know, for people that I was in school with or whatever. But all of those longings are just kind of um, the longing for home, you know, just trying to articulate themselves and, and get experiential exposure. So that nostalgia is really, really important because it, it promotes the journey, yeah? Now, when we do get back home at the end of an incarnation, is there a kind of a tendency then to want to stay there and not to uh, incarnate anymore? It's a huge temptation because when you're surrounded with love and light and bliss, you know, why in God's name would you sign up for pain and torment and uh, planet Earth? And the, yeah, very, very difficult. But the truth is, you know, love is not in the receiving as much as love is in the giving. And that to adequately plumb the kind of the depths of your ability to love, you have to, you have to be compassionate enough uh, to kind of um, sacrifice your own kind of uh, serenity for, the, uh, for those who are locked in the kind of the, um, uh, the temptation of incarnation. And so, as I said this morning, or maybe yesterday, that I take this saying of Jesus where on one occasion he says, there's more joy in heaven over one, so, one sinner who repents than over 99 sinners, uh, who, uh, 99 people who don't need to repent. Um, I change that and I say, there's more joy in heaven over one soul who volunteers for incarnation than over 99 souls who want to stay at home you know, and not risk it anymore. And so I think it's a measure of the love and the evolution of the soul to continue to volunteer for incarnation. And um, Hindu Buddhism will call this the Bodhisattva vow, that there are some people who volunteer, even though they've worked out all their own personal karma, and they've mined incarnation for everything it has to teach, but who still come back in order to wake up the rest of us. And they call that the Bodhisattva. No, I think uh, I've encountered some of those people in... Um, in this last, last launching pad that I just shared with you right now, those who are going to different dimensions, that there are people with such love that um, they're prepared, having learned everything they can learn from Earth incarnations, who are prepared to incarnate in different planetary systems or even into different dimensions, like um, um, extra dimensional insights, dimensions beyond the physical completely, and to kind of do, do there what they've done here that when they find themselves in civilizations which are still foundering, you know, and lost, that they're prepared to dedicate incarnations to, to help to resolve, to heal those situations as well. So as long as there are phenomenological realms, as long as there are extra dimensional realities, as long as there are planetary systems where there's any form of darkness, there are souls who have enough love in them uh, to um, place their own comfort uh, below the comfort and the healing of other people. So Johanna's question is, uh, given that I'm a, a spiritual leader in some form and a psychologist, um, uh, is this an experience I might want to repeat or is this an experience that everybody uh, should have, could have? Um, it is like any um, huge shift in consciousness. It's a very dangerous enterprise, you know? Um, I haven't done drugs, but I understand that, for instance, taking LSD or stuff like that, it creates an extraordinary shift in consciousness. 
And I've studied a lot about this kind of stuff. And I know that from the writings, they call them the, the four S's, that for somebody to have a plant medicine trip, and I'm fascinated by it. And I know of a lot of people whom I admire who've done it and have benefited greatly from it, but they call them the four S's. The first one is the kind of the, um, uh, the, the what do you call it? The substance that you're using. Which substance are you talking about? Mushrooms or psilocybin or LSD or ayahuasca or, or whatever. So the first one is the substance. The second one is the setting. So that people who are doing uh, plant medicine, you know, as a recreational exercise, that's a very different reality from somebody who's doing it with the shaman. And so uh, the kind of the setting which you're doing it is hugely important. The third one is the mindset. With what, for what reason are you attempting to undergo this uh, experience? Are you just having? Are you at a rave party using Adam? You know, with a whole group of people with rock music and flashing lights or whatever. Is that the purpose of the exercise? And the fourth one is the sitter, the person, an accomplished, you know, uh, person who's been down this road many times and is able to guide you and make sure you don't get into any kind of existential problems. And so any significant shift of consciousness has to be accompanied by, you know, a, a sitter who's um, uh, who's knowledgeable and uh, kind of uh, au fait with this journey. And so making sure that you found somebody who can guide you through that exercise and realizing that you're at a stage in your life where you're really prepared to make the kinds of changes that are going to come as a result of the experience. Because a lot of people will have experiences, you know, and then it's over with and it's you're now being invited to change sometimes radically your lifestyle and relationships and uh, your profession. And you say, I'm sorry, that's a bridge too far. I'm not prepared to do that. And so there are some people then who, the Im image I use sometimes is, if there's a mountaintop that I'd like to climb and see the extraordinary vista from the top of it, and it's a very, very high mountain, and that there are two ways of accessing the summit. The first one is I could take a cable car and get up there in an hour and view it and see the scenario and be amazed by it and then come back down. That's one way of doing it. The other way is I could climb the mountain, taking four days to, like, like Kilimanjaro, taking four days or five days to get to, the, get to the, the top, the summit, and then three or four days to get back down. Now, I have the same vista from the top, but it's been a radically different experience. And one of them, I shot up in a cable car and then back down again. So within you know, a few hours, it was over and done with. In the other one, I spent a week of my time uh, camping outdoors, being bitten by mosquitoes, sleeping in the cold, you know, conferring with uh, uh, guides of various kinds, you know, and, and then seeing the view from the top. So I'm significantly changed by the experience because of what I've had to endure uh, to find it as a thing from just a tourist going to the top and coming back down. So I have to be really, really careful what is my reasoning for wanting to change my state of consciousness? And then what am I prepared to do with what's been presented to me? And again, again, I found that there are people, you know, and this is true as well of the near death in experience literature. I've immersed myself in that for many, many years now. And again and again and again, you get keep coming back from near death experiences and they enthusiastically begin to share the experience with the doctors where they were pronounced clinically dead or family members and they're um, labeled as crazy, or it was just the drugs, you were having a hallucination. And so they learned very, very quickly, you know, to think, I'm not going to tell anybody about this anymore. You know, I'm going to get locked up. People in white coats are going to grab me and take me into the psych ward. And that's been their experience, literally their experience. And they're, they're either drugged out of it, you know, or they're frightened out of it. So they keep their mouth shut. And some of them literally for 10, 15, 20, 30 years before they begin to share it. And the second big hindrance is that if they share with their family members, the relationships change and change radically. And often it's the end of a marriage or the end of a profession, you know, so that you have such an altered uh, uh, understanding of who you are and what your purpose is that the old system isn't going to support that anymore and you're not prepared to, to participate in that system anymore. And now you're going to make the kinds of changes that are going to force other people to think you either you're crazy or they don't like the new version of you and they try to force you back into the old version of you. So you have to answer all these questions before you attempt such a journey. Are you prepared to make all those sacrifices, you know, and risk all those possibilities? So Shelley's question has to do with the healing aspect of the, you know, the Bardo state or the LB, LBL. 
particularly uh, if you're, uh, you're coming out of a situation where your physical body is literally tormented by a disease like a severe cancer or in any other situation in your life that's causing extraordinary distress. You know, what happens either when you cross over at the end of an incarnation or you experience, you know, an LVL session. So every every soul that disincarnates, that ends a kind of an incarnational experience is going to uh, encounter some form of the healing space. And uh, those who have been subjected over a prolonged period during incarnation of some kind of distressing physiological or psychological conditions um, are going to uh, be a kind of taken into a, into some kind of a healing modality. Now, there is no timing at the other side, but there is the sense of kind of the, the, the dissolution of the of the disease, whether it's a psychological condition or a, a physiological condition. And so people can spend more or less time in the healing space. You talk about the, the Etruvian one, the kind of I'm stretched out, you know, on, on this kind of a, a five-pronged bed. Now, depending on kind of the evolution of the soul, that a soul that's really evolved, even if it has an experience of um, a prolonged illness like cancer for years and years and years before they, they they crossed over, you know, such a soul will actually lead will need far less healing time at the other side, because their soul hasn't identified with the body. The soul has regarded the the body as a kind of a learning mechanism about life on planet Earth. So it's not there. They can detach really, really quickly from the, the 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 pain or the anxiety of the incarnation just just ended. Now the same thing can be true, I think, for people who die very precipitously, like in a war situation. Um, if it's a if it's a, an advanced soul, they're going to need less time at the other side to experience the healing. Um, so, but it's so it's it's kind of in some sense tailored. Uh, to the level of evolution of the soul and the degree of the uh, suffering and the, the length of the suffering that they've endured. But everybody is going to get the kind of attention they need until they're finally completely kind of uh, learning to kind of, uh, heal and dissociate from the physical body and all the pain they're experienced. And then they begin to move on to the next stages of uh, the soul group or a study or kind of the launch pad for the next incarnation. But the healing, the healing space is vitally important. Now, this is the space where it's multi-tiered in a sense that there are discombobulated entities, you know, who refuse even to to look for light, and they're attached they're attached to the earth sphere, and particularly to addictions of various kinds, and so they're looking for possibilities of possessing a living per a living individual in order to indulge this addiction that can only be kind of satisfied by a, a physiological extension of a, of a spacesuit. So there are beings who refuse to enter any form of light and therefore any possibility of healing modality. But the healers are there. And the healers are extraordinarily patient and the healers are extraordinarily well trained. And so eventually they manage to make contact with and persuade even the discombobulated and the earthbound spirits uh, to turn toward the light. And at that stage, then, they will be invited into a healing space. So it's a more prolonged healing experience then, because there's much more darkness to be undone than for the typical soul. Michelle's question is, when we, when we come to the end of an incarnation, is there some kind of recognition on the part of the incarnated self, you know, that we have come to the end of it, the mission is complete or whatever, or is this a determination made by the soul at the other side of the veil? Um, again, it depends a lot on what my default position is. So I think that it is very, very important to have a cosmology that has a default position, a position to which I uh, immediately gravitate in any situation of importance. So to share an example from um, um, Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi, he had a devotion to a particular um, uh, guide or, uh, in the Hindu system called Rama. You know, and so hundreds of times a day, he just pronounced the mantra, Aram, 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 Aram. And so that this was his default position, whether he was being persecuted in any way or on trial in any way, this was his default modality, Ram, Ram, Ram. And when in 1948, he was assassinated by um, a Brahmin priest who was shot twice, once in the chest and one in the head, once in the head, you know, 
And immediately he started pronouncing Ram, 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 so that he had acquired this default position so that even in extremis, that's immediately where he went. So it's very important for us to have some kind of a default position. Where do I go in situations of importance or situation of distress? What is my default position? And if I default into fear, then I'm racked with um, a selfishness and narcissism. I'm in going to self-protective mode. If my default position is is uh, love, I default into compassion for other people. And so no matter what situation presents itself in life, we're all going to go into a default position. So I have to train myself. What do I want to be my default position in any, any life situation, in, up to and including you know the moment of death? And if I've trained myself that in any situation of consequence, that I've trained myself to default to love, I will uh, I will immediately uh, exhibit compassion and courage. If I've trained myself consciously or unconsciously to default to fear, I'll immediately go into self-protection and narcissism. So now I've come to the end of an earthly incarnation and circumstances are such that it seems to, obvious to me, you know, I'm dying right now. What is my default position at this stage? Am I going to cry out for, no, don't let this happen to me, or you know, am I going to rally against, against faith? Or am I realizing this is what I prepared for my entire life? And now what is going to be my mantra, whether it's internalized or vocalized or whatever, into what default position am I going to land? And if I haven't trained myself, I'm going to land in fear. If I have trained myself, I'm going to land in love and in compassion. And so to the, the extent that I've learned the default position that I want to exit with, I will have much greater sense of, yes, this is my time and I'm ready to go. And now there's a, a collusion between the soul and the mentors on one side, you know, and the, uh, the, the incarnated person on the other side. And there's total agreement about it. Yes, this is the exit ramp and I'm ready to go. And here's how I'm going to go. Stefan's question is, uh, in order to help us to kind of... Uh, uh, land on a default uh, position which is good for us and healing and loving for us is there some kind of a manual or a training at the other side that allows us there is a total preparation at the other side before incarnation you know given the family the body the physical brain i'm going to dock with the culture of which i'm going to be a part the era of human history that i'm going to kind of parachute into there's a total training of what the likelihood is you know, what the possible kind of outcomes are. And therefore, there's the impression again and again, we are going to be kind of seeding it from the other side. We're going to give you kind of hints occasionally. So you're going to have deja vu experiences. We're going to speak to you in dreams. We're going to speak to you through intu your intuition. We're going to speak to you through chance encounters that when the student is ready, the teacher is going to appear. And we've all had that experience of teachers appearing when we were ready for it. And that's been orchestrated from the other side to kind of say, okay, can you get it? Are you he getting the hint? So again and again and again, we've been trained for and we're being prompted by a model that gets you into the default position. But most of us are asleep at the wheel. You know, we don't put time into it. We don't listen. We think, oh, that's just a coincidence, you know, or that was just, that was just the look of the draw. And so we fail to see synchronicities. We we kind of, kind of write them away as just... Uh, uh, either fortunate or, unfor or fortunate occurrence. So it's like uh, God must be tearing her hair out at the other side. How many more hints do I have to give you before you wake up and realize, you know, this is what it's about and this is what you volunteered for and these were the uh, signs we agreed upon before you came. You know, like um, the butterfly that landed on Ireland's hand, you know, that was a sign to, to Ireland. And so, yes, we get all the hints we need and all the training we wanted at the other side. You know, to be able to land in the default position. None of us arrives at the end unprepared. So Karen's question is, uh, when I had this final encounter with my sister Ethna, I'm the firstborn of six kids. Ethna was the fourthborn. I was kind of raised by my grandparents for the first six years of my life. So I come back to my own family, not really knowing uh, my brother and sister. Uh, so Seamus and Deirdre, who were number two and number three, had bonded. They'd been raised together. I know I'm landed into this family. You know, I don't know them. 
I've been, I've seen them once or twice in six years. I don't know who they are really. And now I arrive, and there's a new baby has been born into the family. Ethna, she's a little, a little baby. So Seamus and Deirdre had bonded. So now I bond with Ethna. And so although there's a um, there's a five year discrepancy between us, and we were always really really close growing growing up, really close. And then she moved to England. Uh, she married an Englishman, Alan. He was a, a chemical engineer. They moved to they moved to Abu Dhabi. He was working in Abu Dhabi, and then they moved to France. He's working with Total, and then they moved to Aberdeen, and he's working with North Sea Oil. And then, um, at age forty one, Ethna has a brain aneurysm, and I'm living in Palo Alto in a place called St. Anne's at the time. I have never had a, had headaches as an adult, ever, ever, ever had headaches. And I wake up about two o'clock in the morning, my time, with this vicious, throbbing headache. You know, I need to, what the hell is going on here? And I never get headaches. And I kind of force myself to go back to sleep. And I'm woken, uh, awakened again about an hour and a half later with this other vicious, vicious headache that I can't explain. About 10 minutes later, my phone rings. And it's Ethna's husband, Alan. And he's ringing from the hospital in Aberdeen, where they lived. And he tells me that Ethna, Ethna has been rushed to hospital and suffered two kind of brain events. And they coincided precisely with the headaches that I was having. So I get on a plane next day and I fly into uh, to London and then from London to Aberdeen. And I land in Aberdeen in the middle of a huge snowstorm. It was the 26th of January in 1995. And we're the last plane to land in Aberdeen Airport. The airport is closed down immediately after because of the, of the snow. And then I spend the next time in the in the hospital with the extended family. My, my family from Ireland has also flown in you know, and um, so we're gathered around her bed and she's uh, on life support system. And we're, you know, talking and, you know, praying for her. And uh, she had let uh, instructions that her body be donated, the organs be donated. So she's taken off life support and dies. And that night, I have an experience of her. And two days later, I do the toughest thing in my life to celebrate the funeral mass of my sister. She was 41. And she had three little girls, three children. Yeah. And so when I encounter Ethna in this um life between lives in this last section of it, you know, and I see there are three people in my soul pod um, who are not part of my life right now, that my great grandmother and my grandfather, you know, and they're incarnated elsewhere, but they're not in my life right now, as shown. And Ethna is not on the planet at that stage. Now, this was 18 years ago. I can't say what's happened since then. But that when I talked with her in this final section, you know, and I wonder why she hadn't reincarnated and the message she gave me, she left three little girls behind her and she's committed to finishing the task of raising these little, uh, these girls. Now, in fact, they're all married to the stage and so Etna is, you know, a grandmother from the other side. But uh, 18 years ago, her message to me is, whatever task you sign up for, finish it. I signed up for a task of being the mother to three little girls and I'm going to see it through. And when I finish that task, I'll incarnate again. And so the, to answer Karen's question then, you know, um, it's so really important for us to figure out for what have I incarnated? What is my purpose and what is my mission? And to make sure I see it through. That there have been times, you know, when it looked like there, the mission could have been aborted. I've had personally three, not near death experiences, but close to death experiences. When I thought this is my exit ramp, the first one is in Kenya, 
I'm living in a very remote area, a place called uh, Cabernet. Um, and I got malaria regularly. Every year I got malaria at least once. And I would treat myself. We had a, a drug called Daraprim that we took. And so I have this really debilitating, you know, experience. And I think it's malaria again. And I'm treating myself for malaria. And I'm literally wasting away. I'm living in a mission where I'm not going to see another priest or another missionary three or, th three or four months at a time. And I'm lying in my bed in my mission, dying, you know, and I'm and my entire body is literally shaking with the fever. And my mind is going all over the place. And as clear as a bell, there's a voice inside me that says, your body is doing what bodies are built to do, but you're not your body. Your emotions are doing what your emotions are built to do, but you're not your emotions. Your mind is doing what minds are built to do, but you're not your mind. And there's this extraordinary equanimity. My body is still shaking with the fever. And kind of there's, I'm, I'm sweating like crazy, you know, but there's a part of me, the soul self has emerged and it's saying, it's not your time to go. Don't, don't worry what your body is doing or what your mind is doing, what your emotions are doing. Forget about that. Listen to me. And as luck would have it, uh, somebody came by and just yanked me out of there and took me to the hospital. You know, I spent about two weeks in the hospital and then got shipped back to Ireland. So that was the first occasion. The second occasion was um, I'm living where I'm living now in an old cabin that had been built in the 1880s. Uh, and there's a kind of, I have a refrigerator, which is a kind of a, a kind of a propane gas refrigerator in a small little cabin. Uh, and I'm there on my own four days a week. And then three days a week, I'm down in Palo Alto, you know, as part of the COJ community and as a psychologist. And uh, this particular evening, I'm feeling really, really, really kind of weird. And I drag myself into into my bedroom, you know, and I think I'm dying. And uh, it's interesting. It was the, um, it was exactly the fourth anniversary of Ethna's death. So it's the 25th of January, now in 1999. And I drag myself into the bedroom and I start singing hymns in Gaelic. I think, okay, I'm exiting, you know, I'm going to sing my way home. And I'm singing these songs in, in Gaelic. And somehow I survived the night. And in the morning, I phone Ireland, who's living down in San Rafael. And she and I were supposed to meet that day in a solicitor's office to, to sign some papers about the, the land in which we lived, uh, the finalization of the land. And I talked to her on the phone and she says, what's wrong with you? I said, I don't have the energy to to get down to San Rafael today. You're going to have to do this on your own. And she said, what are your symptoms? I start telling her. Now, Arlen is, um, is a trained naturopathic physician. And she says, get the hell out of there. You're suffering from carbon monoxide poisoning. And she phones a neighbor of mine who just flies away, alerts him. He drives in. Now I'm out on the deck of the cabin trying to breathe in fresh air. And this guy, um, John Delisle, drags me and brings me down to the hospital in uh, Healdsburg. And they uh, question me, they said, what do you think is happening? And I said, I think I'm having a brain aneurysm. You know, this is how my sister died four years ago today. Now, they took a blood sample, but there's no there's no laboratory in the hospital in Hillsburg. It's too small. So they had to send it out to uh, Santa Rosa and wait for five or six hours to get the result back. In the meantime, Ireland has driven like the bat out of hell from San Rafael with a homeopathic remedy uh, called Carbo Veg and gave it to me. And uh, she said to the doctor, well, look at his face. Can't you see from his face that it's carbon monoxide poisoning? A kind of a symptom of carbon monoxide poisoning is you get you get beet red, your face goes beet red because of the lack of oxygen. So she gives me the homeopathic remedy, and then they put me on a, a breathing machine, and literally within within 17 hours I'm out of there. So she, that was the first of a few times in which she saved my life. So that was the second time, and somehow the, my soul said, "This is not your exit. You know, wait again." And the last one is, I have an, an, I had an apartment down in in Menlo Park. Um, uh, and I I was down there three or four days a week. And um, I have a real love of Indian food, particularly hot, spicy food. And my office was out in Los Altos and I'd see clients from nine o'clock in the morning until seven o'clock in the evening. And then I'd go to a, um, a restaurant, which is called uh, Cafe Bombay nearby. 
and they'd have uh, Indian food, which I really loved. It was very, very spicy food. And then I'd go home, write up my notes, and then go to bed by about 11 o'clock. And so I would suffer occasionally from acid reflux because of, the, of that diet. And so I wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning and I can't breathe. And it feels like there's a bubble over my trachea so that when I try to breathe in, it's like the bubble goes just undulates going down, but I can't pierce it. I can't get air into my lungs. And I try to breathe out and the bubble just goes in the opposite direction and I can't breathe out. So I can't breathe in and I can't breathe out. And I hear a voice in my head saying, you have 30 seconds of consciousness left. Now, I thought about this many, many times. Is it possible to do a Heimlich on oneself? And I figured out it was. So I get out of bed. I go to the bathroom. There's a bathroom sink in front of me. I get a bath towel. I put it over the corner of the sink. And I fire myself against it. You know, fire myself against it. And then the third firing, I go, up, And I can breathe again. Mm. And my entire body is covered with I'm just a cold, cold, clammy sweat. But I can breathe. So I go to my office. And I write my will. I said, okay, I got the message. <laughs> but obviously, that was not the exit ramp, you know? And so it feels like um, when the time is, is ready, the soul will come make the decision, you know, that circumstances are not going to determine when the exit is, that the soul is going to make it. And that I obviously, I still had some more work to do. And the soul is saying, okay, you know, you got some, something else to do. And it's interesting. It was after that I had this uh, LBL experience and realized I need to do a significant shift in, in how I was uh, uh, kind of uh, activating my priesthood. You know, I need to do it differently. So that's a long, long answer to an interesting question. So Susie's insight was that, you know, um, doing an LBL session or anything which creates an altered state of consciousness immediately involves some kind of a radical shifts in uh, you, how you're doing life. And she made the comment that that's what Jesus did. And it's interesting to me that it was at age 30 that he made that change, that for the first 30 years, he's a nice, sensible boy, a carpenter in Nazareth. And all of a sudden, he's going around and he's preaching, you know. And um, I was saying a few weeks ago in a homily that um, his family thought he was crazy, literally thought he was crazy. If you read Mark's Gospel, chapter 3 of Mark's Gospel, in verse 21 and in verse 31, what you read was, when Jesus began his public ministry at age 31, we are told, his family came to take him by force because they thought he had gone mad. And so his brothers and sisters, his uncles and aunts, you know, he's got his mother, he's worked as a carpenter for 30 years, you know, and now all of a sudden he's this guru and healer, you know, he's going to make a fool of the family. Everybody in Nazareth is going to think, you know, this is a crazy, this is a crazy guy. And so they want to, they want to come and take him by force. And he refuses to meet with them. So they go back home and they try to persuade his mother. Can you come and talk some sense to him? And in verse 31 in chapter 3 of Mark, his mother comes back. And Jesus is sitting inside in the house surrounded by his disciples. So they can't get into the house. It's too packed. So they send in a message and they say, your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside and they want to talk to you. You always know when somebody says, they want to talk to you. What's going to happen? And Jesus looked around and says, who is my mother? And who are my brothers and sisters? My mother and my brothers and sisters are those who hear the word of God and align with it. Now, I don't believe that this was a condemnation of Mary because Mary in spades did what he was saying. My mother is those who hear the word of God and comply with it. She did that her entire life but she's there as a prop for those who, who aren't as advanced as she. And so he refuses to talk to them. But So it's this huge change. He's immediately going to lose his family members, you know, and then he's going to be literally, they will actually try to kill him in Nazareth. When he goes back to Nazareth and begins you know, preaching his own, they take him to the edge of a cliff and we're told, who in God's name is this guy? Isn't this the carpenter's son? Don't we know his mother? Aren't his brothers here? And they name his brothers. Aren't his sisters living with us? Where did he get all these powers? Who the hell does he think he is? And it says, they tried to push him off the edge of the cliff or the villages, and he just walked through their midst. And so he's immediately going to lose everybody. He's going to lose his family. He's going to lose his cousins. He's going to lose his reputation. He's going to lose his standing as a nice Jewish boy who went to synagogue every Friday. He's going to lose all that. 
The Pharisees are going to turn against him. The Sadducees are going to turn against him. He's going to be a thorn in the side of the political authorities. And finally, they're going to crucify him. And so in some senses, these are the great temptations in the life of Jesus. And so when you read the story in Luke's gospel and Matthew's gospel, that Jesus, as soon as he was baptized in the Jordan by John, and bingo, that was his ayahuasca experience, getting baptized in the Jordan by John was the plant medicine that Jesus used, you know, or the kind of shift in consciousness between who he thought he was and who he really was. And so now this is, represents such a huge shift that after the baptism, he didn't just go home and start saying, okay, here's a mess and I want, to, I want to teach guys and then start preaching. He didn't do that. He went into the desert to think, am I really ready for this? Can I really, can you make this radical change in my life? And what will the consequences be? And so he's not just tempted at the end of 40 days, he's tempted for the entire duration of 40 days. Have I really got the courage and the tenacity and the willpower to see this through with all that it involves? And the real possibility that given the situation in which I live, given the political situation and the religious situation, there's a very good, a very good possibility I'm going to wind up crucified because that was the normal method of execution. It's a very good chance that's what's going to happen. So he spends 40 days wrestling with this. And then throughout his life, it's going to visit him again and again and again. That various people in his life will have an agenda for him. Uh, okay, why don't you do it this way? You know, his um, brothers and sisters wanted him to do it in a particular way. There's a story in Matthew's Gospel in chapter 20, verse 20, where his aunt comes to him, and she's the mother of James and John. And she says to him, it seems obvious now that you're, gonna, you're really going to make it. You're going to be a really kind of, you're a mensch. You're going to really make it here. And so all of these other guys, you know, uh, Peter and you know, Zacchaeus and Levi, I, all, I knew these guys. I knew them when they were little boys with their backside sticking out through their trousers. Uh, so, you know, uh, they're important, but my two boys, you know, I want you to guarantee me that when you come into your kingdom, John will sit on your right and James will sit on your left. And Jesus said to her, you have no idea what you're asking for. Do you realize what chalice they're going to have to drink from? They had no idea what they're signing up for. So she's got an agenda for him. His brothers and sisters have an agenda for him. The Pharisees and the Sadducees have an agenda. If only you paid by the rules, by the law, you know, by Torah, maybe we can give you a, a lesson. Um, the, the Herod has an agenda for him. Herod hears about this miracle worker and is thinking, wow, I'd like to see some kind of a display of power. Herod gets to meet Jesus. And Herod is the only person in the Gospels that Jesus refuses completely to exchange a single word with. Because it's the last day of his life. He's not going to waste words on this buffoon who wants to see a kind of an entertainment uh, show. But all of these people have a different agenda for him. And Christ is struggling completely. And then on the last night of his life, in Gethsemane, he has the mother of all panic attacks. So intense that he's literally uh, sweating blood. And that's actually a physiological condition where the blood can actually permeate the veins system and express itself you know, on, on the epiderm. And so it's so intense. And the, re the real temptation there, I think, was that Satan says to Jesus, you're being gaslighted. There is no father. There is no God. You're not the son of God. You do not have a mission. You bought into this pile of crap I know you're going to be dead this time tomorrow, you know? So Satan is trying to gaslight him, and Jesus is thinking, oh my, what if it's true? What if I've, you know, made this volte facie three years ago, spent my entire life risking crucifixion, and that it was a mirage, it was a hallucination, there is no God, I'm not on a mission, the Father did not dep uh, deputize me to do this. What if that's true? And that's kind of the, the in some sense, that's the penultimate um, temptation of Jesus. But he says, Father, is it possible that you can let this chalice pass me? Is there a possibility I could kind of um, accomplish the same mission by doing it differently? Let me kind of just, why don't I just leave Jerusalem and head for someplace else, you know, and I'll try someplace else or in some different modality. And then finally it said, but I know that this is the way I volunteered for. This is what I signed up for. So not my will, but thine be done. And then Satan will have won one last shot next day on the cross as Christ is dying in agony on the cross. And Jesus will shout out, and he's, he's um, um, quoting Psalm 91. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God.
Why have you abandoned me? And that was the final effort of Satan to get between Jesus and his mission. But Jesus could finally say, finally, it is accomplished. I finished the mission. Oh, Daddy, hug me. So be careful what you ask for. Be careful if you really want to kind of um, experience your true self and your true purpose. Be prepared for significant changes in your life. Corey's question was, does, do I think that I made a commitment on the launching pad for this incarnation? And I certainly did. You know, I certainly committed to being um, some kind of an awakening agent in whatever kind of guise I found myself you know, either as a teacher, as a priest, or a psychologist, or whatever, that my commitment was just was to try to be a teacher. And as I say, again and again and again, a teacher is not somebody who uh, gives you information to which you previously didn't have access. That's not a teacher. You know, that's a lecturer, maybe, but it's not a teacher. A teacher is somebody who helps you roll back the amnesia for what you already know, because your soul is omniscient. Your soul, you know, is a bite-sized fractal of source. And so the really great teachers are the people who help us remember who we really are, the ones who create the aha experience when you listen to them, because they're articulating something that you deeply know in your core. You know, So there's a recognition of the truth of what they're saying, not that this is new information uh, to you. And so I certainly made that kind of a commitment in this, in this lifetime to be... Corey's add-on question is, do I think that Jesus made that commitment as well on the launching pad in his lifetime between lifetimes? I think, obviously, Jesus is uh, at the apex of enlightenment. If you were to kind of use a slider switch in a metaphor for luminosity, it's as bright as can possibly get. The Jesus figure is as bright as it can possibly get because he totally and utterly understood that he is uh, a fractal of source. And uh, even in his pre-public ministry days, you know, his very presence would emanate that kind of energy, not just into the immediacy of his environment, but into the, the global and maybe even cosmic uh, arena. Um, but that the timing was important. Uh, it's very interesting to me that many of the great, great avatars, uh, that the, uh, the uh, final awakening happening happens about 30 years into incarnation. So Buddha had the very same exp experience. The Buddha gets, you know, the Buddha is born into a princely family and is totally secluded from aging and illness and death. He's not allowed out of the palace in case he'd encounter these things. And then it, he gets married, he has a little baby. And at that stage, he wants to go see what's outside the palace. And he goes out three nights surreptitiously with a guide who knows the outside. And the first time he sees an old bent man, he says, what's that? He's never been allowed to see age. And the guy says, that's what happens to all of us. We age and we bend over and we're decrepit. I said, holy God. He goes out the second night and he sees uh, somebody who was really, really ill, really racked with, with, with illness. And the Buddhist says, what's that? And the guy says to him, that's the kind of what the majority of people experience outside this palace where you're protected. People get sick. And he's shocked. And he goes out a third night and he sees bodies being brought to the gas where they're bringing a stretcher with a corpse in it being brought to the funeral pyre to be burned. And he says, what is that? And the guy says, everybody dies. And that's what happens, you know, you die, you put on the, the beer, you're brought to the fire and you're cremated. And he's totally shocked by it. And he goes back to the palace goes into his bedroom, his wife and his little baby are sleeping, and he kisses them, and he leaves the palace. And he goes off into the forest. And for the next six years, he's hanging out with gurus of various kinds, trying to become enlightened. And he tries all kinds of modalities, including kind of the ultimate asceticism, where he's literally trained his body to survive on a single grain of rice a day. And at the end of six years, he's no nearer enlightenment than he was before. And so he then famously goes under the, the Bodhi tree and he sits under it and says, I'm not going to leave here. 
until I'm enlightened. And he sits there until enlightenment happens. And he's been tempted exactly as Jesus is. Mara comes to him. Mara is the name that's given to the tempter or Satan. In the, in the Buddhist tradition, Mara comes to tempt him. And one of the temptations is exactly like the temptation Jesus has. Mara says, you know, if you're really this compassionate, you know, avatar, turn the Himalayas, the highest mountain in the world, turn it into gold, and then you can feed all the people of the world. And the Buddha says to him, if I could turn all of the mountains all over the world into gold, there wouldn't be enough gold to satisfy one person's greed. Yeah, because it would be confiscated and used by the elite to kind of imprison humanity. And so he risks it and he reaches enlightenment. But it's interesting, it happens exactly at the same time, 29, 30. So you look at a lot of the uh, great gurus and teachers, and there's something happens at that, at that stage where the soul who has been pre-prepared for a radical shift of consciousness and, minis and ministry, you know, is going to first experience the normal life style and then have to make the shift into a totally different kind of uh, lifestyle. And then the question becomes, you know, can I risk a kind of all of the changes involved and the breakdown of relationships and previous self-images? So two questions, one having to do with parallel lives and the other having to do with uh, trying, to, trying to figure out who's in our soul pods. So in parallel lifetimes, I am totally convinced of it that most of us are experiencing parallel lifetimes and that these experiences, they bleed into our awareness, they, 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 they cross-fertilize uh, when we're in altered states of consciousness. So whether you're on a visionary trip, however it's induced, or whether you're dreaming at night, or whether you're in deep, deep meditation, that there are data which are being made available to you to which you don't normally have access because there are data which are being generated by a parallel lifetime. And by parallel processing, we're speeding up, you know, the kind of the, the process of our soul's evolution. So I'm convinced that it's not just great souls, excuse me, it's not just great souls who have the capacity to parallel life, but that all of us have the capacity to do it. And that when we have, um, when we start listening to our dreams, or listening to our imagination, or listening to intuitive flashes, our deja vu experiences, it's a it's a bleeding a bleed through. Some are coming from the higher self and our mentors, and some are some are coming from other articulations of the soul, which are currently in incarnation. And by currently, I don't necessarily mean that they're in the same century, because time is an illusion. I can be parallel processing in the 11th century, the 21st century, and the 55th century, all right now as shown. And so, yeah, we can parallel parallel process. And the second question Anne was asking was, is there any way of knowing who's in our soul pod you know, while we're still incarnated? Now, again, I think um, we have to kind of transcend the kind of the... Uh, the models of the psycho, uh, the psychological models or the psychophysiological models or the sociological models that we're brought up with and think that, oh, my soul pod must be all family members. Uh, um, it's very unusual in my experience and what I've read that your parents are going to be part of your soul pod. Very often they're not. Very often they're coming from your shadow pod that they came home down here to really test you. And so, uh, l yeah, literally, and so looking at your family, your, uh, your present configuration of family members, there will be some people who are your soul pod and there will be other people who are not. And so the, the proximity of the relationship like uh, father and child or uh, mother and child is not an indicator of, of being in the soul pod. And so how might you experience who the soul pod members are? I think there will be a kind of an intuitive knowing now, before I say this properly, I'm going to say that I, 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 told, I said yesterday that if you drop a pebble into a still pond, you're going to create ripples, and then you're going to create concentric circles of ripples. And so that in some senses, every sentient being is part of your extended soul pod. But then as you move in concentric circle by concentric circle by concentric circle, there are, there are some people who are more likely to be a part regularly of your incarnational cycles and therefore part of your, the inner group. So at the very core of it is going to be your soul mate. In my case, Arlen. You know, that I know that that's my soul mate. That's the first level. You know, around that then are some 
people, you know, that I've encountered in this incarnation, certainly my brother Seamus, um, certainly my sister Ethna, uh, Eamon Hayden, who was my spiritual director, my great grandmother and my uh, and my grandfather. I know that these are part of my soul pod and that I've been with them many, many times in many incarnations. And I know that instinctively. Um, there are other people whom I feel really close to and whom I've met uh, in my incarnation as Sean. And there's an immediate knowing that we have been really close to each other. This is not our first rodeo together. And so that um, there's the kind of the intuitive knowing, yeah, yeah, I have a special connection, an energetic bonding with this person. Now, at what level of the soul pod would I situate them? If I were to go into an LBL session, would they be part of the inner core or not? I don't know. But I know that and that sometimes the 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 other levels, the other concentric rings, uh, three or four iterations out, in some senses, may be no less important than the ones in the very core. So it's not like a hierarchical system. So whenever I feel the kind of this instantaneous connection and this bonding with somebody, and it doesn't matter where I am, whether it's in Ireland, it's happening in Ireland, or it's happening in Africa, or it's happening in Palo Alto, that there are people, and there are people in this room with whom I've had that uh, uh, experience immediately on meeting them, you know, and over the years has proven, as far as I'm concerned, to be really, really true. And so um, just looking at uh, what your intuition is telling you, what level of connection do you feel to somebody, even if you're 60 years old, when you met the person for the first time, you know, um, what level of connection do you feel and what level of um, love do you feel? And what level level of kind of protectiveness do you feel? That you would give your life to save theirs. <laughs> For those of you on Zoom, Pat's question was... <laughs> Do I get the same kind of intuitive flash when I meet somebody who's part of my shadow pod? <laughs> definitely, definitely. And so that's a huge indicator that this is a vitally important member, you know, of my life journey. Uh, an instinctive dislike to somebody, and, and I mean that an instinctive dislike, or uh, if it's an ongoing relationship that we're constantly banging heads and we're constantly landing on different sides, different perspectives on important issues to us. So I have a practice, for instance, when, when I'm counseling uh, um, clients of mine, again and again and again, when I'm dealing with a couple, I see there are four issues that constantly present themselves in couples' relationship. And the first one is communication. Yeah. How well or how badly are these two people communicating with each other? That's always the first one and the most important one. The second one is the place of sexuality in that relationship. How satisfying is it or how frustrating is it for members, you know, in their sexual expression, in their level of intimacy and the longevity of it? How long does it last or how quickly does it become stale? The third one is finances, you know. How are finances? How are we working together in our finances? Are we a team here? Are we, are, are we at loggerheads with each other? Are we constantly fighting about finances? And the fourth one would be what I would call uh, kind of your personal cosmology or your philosophy of life. Where do you land on the important questions, whether they're political questions or, you know, the rightness or the wrongness of abortion? You know, where do you land, you know, in your individual perspectives within this relationship? And I found over the years, you know, that uh, these are the four issues that we're going to have to address in couples counseling. And so you'll find out fairly quickly, am I married to somebody whom I have intentionally, you know, and bilateral, by, by bilateral agreement would be my, my spouse or my partner here, you know. And so after an initial period, I find out very quickly what happens. So I see uh, couple, couples' relationships go through very distinct phases. The first phase is infatuation. The sun and the moon and the stars shine out of my beloved and you know, I'm infatuated by her and I can't see beyond her. And that's a very easy stage of relationship. And most, uh, most relationships begin like that. And what it is, it is two personas dancing. I don't really see who you are. I'm infatuated 
with whom I want you to be. And I'm presenting a version of me that I want you to fall in love with. And so it's my persona, my mask, dancing with your mask. That's the first stage. The second stage is intimacy. Now we begin to share our lives, our finances, our bodies, our living arrangements with each other. You know, and that's the second stage. And uh, that's really, really easy to be in for a period of time. The third stage always comes. And I call it disillusionment. Because the first two stages are an illusion. I'm not really in love with you. I'm in love with whom I want you to be. And I'm going to present to you a version of me that I hope you'll fall in love with. But now we get to a stage where the two egos have emerged. It's not my mask kind of trying to seduce your mask. It is my ego being pissed at your ego. I know the two egos are battling with each other. That's stage three. Now, if we have the commitment and the resources to work through this stage, then we reach stage four, which is true love, which is the two souls dancing with each other. We have transcended ego, and now it is my soul dancing with your soul. But that takes a lot of work. And so that's the kind of that's the kind of the trajectory of relationship. And if we're prepared to do it, you know, real love will be the, the final product of it. And then you begin to discover that this obviously was somebody that came from my soul group. But marriages that break down significantly, particularly in a short period of time where I can't stand the sight of my ex, you know, that's obviously an indication that we chose each other as shadow pod members. Great question, Beth. <laughs> so there's a lot of mythology about the missing years of Jesus. And to give you a context for it, um, important people in history have often been given fictitious childhoods. They become really, really famous at some stage. Nothing is known about their childhood. So we know we fabricate. They must have had extraordinary childhoods in order to produce such an extraordinary adult. And there are a whole bunch of Gnostic Gospels, one of them called the Infancy Gospel of Jesus, that talks about his, his, his childhood. He was an obnoxious little brat. Literally, if you read through this, an obnoxious little brat who literally blinded a kid and killed a kid for calling him names. And then when the parents of the, the child came to complain to Joseph and Mary, the child, Jesus, threatened to blind them as well. So you're creating fictitious childhoods for anybody who is of significant historical kind of uh, prominence. So that's part of the problem. Because when you look at the life of Jesus, you know, there is nothing mentioned in the Gospels between age 12 and age 30. And in actual fact, only Luke has a single event in his gospel of Jesus at age 12. So if you look at Mark's gospel, uh, and um, there's no mention whatsoever of a childhood of Jesus, not even of his birth circumstances. Matthew and Luke create birth narratives, and Luke, who's the only non-Jewish writer of Scripture, uh, gets his geography mixed up. You know, so he has Jesus being born in, in, in Nazareth and then having come to, to, to Bethlehem to be registered, which was completely wrong. And he gets the dates wrong. He talks about Quirinius being the governor of Syria when Jesus was, was born and the first census that was happened. And it did not happen during Quirinius' uh, time. So Luke gets a lot of the details wrong. So they're getting details wrong about the birth of this child. You know, and then only Luke has an event. So uh, those who do call, talk about the birth of Jesus just talk about his birth and then for the first few days afterwards. And then there's nothing until age 30. Luke has one event in chapter two of his gospel where he talks about an event at age 12 where Jesus and his parents go down from Nazareth to Jerusalem for a big Jewish feast. And typically it's a three day safari down and a three day safari back. And then they they live in a tented city around Jerusalem for the duration of, the, uh, of the, the celebration. And at that stage, the population of Jerusalem went from about 40,000 people to one and a half million people. So you had a huge tented city around Jerusalem. And then the feast is over. After three days, they start the journey back. And at the end of the day, they realize the 12-year-old boy isn't with them. And they freak out. And they're inquiring from the resident, did you see Jesus? I'm not talking about you know, an, evangel an evangelical preacher. Did you see Jesus? I'm not talking about that. Like the kid, our kid. Have you seen our kid? And they haven't. And so they come back down to Jerusalem and spend three days looking for him. And then they find him in the temple, kind of debating with the, the scholars. And he's age 12. And then that's the end of it, according to Luke. 
And then there's this big gap up to age 30. Nothing happens. So we need to fill in the missing years. So there's lots of uh, mythology, lots of stories, and apparently some even ancient manuscripts that talk about what the possibilities were. So I'll, I'll mention a few of the possibilities. There's one possibility that uh, Joseph of Arimathea was Jesus' uncle. And in fact, Jesus is actually buried in Joseph's tomb because he didn't have a tomb of his own when he died. So he's buried in a tomb belonged to Joseph of Arimathea. And Joseph is a very well-connected man. Joseph was able to go to, to a pilot, the governor, and say, you know, uh, I want to take the body of my nephew off the cross. He's dead already, which was very unusual because crucified people could live for days. But the, the three people who were crucified, um, they broke their legs because the next day was a big Jewish feast and you can't have bodies hanging on crosses during the big Jewish feast. So this terrible thing they did was they would break the knee, the shin bone of those who were crucified. And so now the, the crucified person couldn't support their weight. When they were crucified, there was a little kind of a pedestal which was appended to the cross that they could they could land on. And the difficulty of... of uh, Crucifixion, uh, probably the most extraordinary and vicious method of execution that was ever invented. And it wasn't invented by the Romans. It was invented by the Persians and used by the Romans and others as well. There were two versions of it. Uh, you could hang somebody off the cross with no foot rest. And then within a few hours, the squeezing of the chest, because the body is squeezing the chest closed, they would die from uh, a kind of anoxia. They couldn't breathe anymore. But then to prolong the agony, they created a stool so that the crucified person now had to kind of vary between supporting his weight by his feet and raising himself up so he could breathe. And then at, at some stage, the feet hurting so badly that he had to relax and then he sink down and now his chest is crushed and he can't breathe again. So he tries to push himself back up. And so uh, it could take four or five days for a person to die in that manner. And so because it was a feast, they had another practice, the Romans that come around and they'd break the shin bone of the crucifix, and now all the weight immediately went onto the onto the hands, and now within a few minutes you can't breathe and you die, and that's what they come. They come and they break the shin bone of the first thief and the second thief, and they come to Jesus, you know, and the century says he's already dead. There's no need to break uh, his shin bones, and they said to be sure, to be sure, they stick a, a spear in the side and they perforate the heart, and then blood and water comes out, and so that's the given story. Um, Joseph Arimathea is so well connected, he can go to Pilate and say, my nephew is dead. I want permission to take the body down immediately. And Pilate sends out soldiers to check this out. Is he dead already? They come back and say, yeah, he's dead. Okay, you can take it down. And they take him down and they put him in the tomb. Now this is where the mythology takes off and it's interesting. Uh, one version is that the women came to anoint the body of Jesus. But that what happened was that uh, when Jesus was dying on the cross, that when he said, I thirst, they reached him a sponge which is soaked with vinegar, you know, to slake his thirst. But that in actual fact, part of the Qumran community, the Essenes, had developed life-sustaining kind of, uh, um, uh, how would I call it, herbs of various kinds, that they put them on the sponge and they gave them to Jesus and that would create a state of animated, of suspended animation that to all intents and purposes, the person is dead. And so it looks like he's dead, but what's happening is he's put in a state of suspended animation. And they take him into the tomb then, and they're going to anoint him. And that in the meantime, you know, this these herbs are taking a kind of their course, and he comes back to full consciousness. And then he's taken uh, on the third day, he's fit to travel, and he's taken away from there. And he's taken to India or Tibet, different versions of it. And the healing is complete. And then he spends many, many years as a teacher and a healer in Tibet and in India. And there are monasteries in Tibet that claim to have literally ancient documents talking about a visit from, from the West of a saint called Isa, who made a huge impression, and that there's actually a tomb there where the body is buried. And that some Western travel travelers have been given access to those documents. So that's one version of the story that that's you know what happened, but that in in the interim in the eighteen years when he's missing, 
that he's visiting a lot of different areas and uh, exposing himself uh, to the teachings of other great avatars, including the mystery schools in Egypt and the kind of Buddhist and Hindu teachings of, of India and Tibet. And that as a young boy, he's actually been brought uh, uh, to Cornwall in southwest England, which is a Celtic stronghold. Gaelic is still spoken in, in Cornwall. There are six locations in Western Europe where Gaelic is still a spoken language. One of them is in Brittany, in northwest France, where they speak Breton. Another one is the Isle of Man, where they speak a form of Gaelic. Another one is um, Wales, where it's still spoken. Another one is Ireland, obviously, where it's spoken. Another one is Scotland. But there's a part of uh, southeast England called Cornwall, uh, which Gaelic uh, was spoken and is still spoken. And it's famous as well, so it, it's druidical past. And it's famous, there were very important tin mines in in uh, Cornwall. And that Joseph Armatea was um, a tin merchant who traveled around the world uh, trying to find resources. And that he would take the boy Jesus with him on these, on these trips. And that Jesus got exposed to, to the Druids and Celtic mythology. And so that he's been exposed to all of these kinds of wisdom traditions, and that that was how he spent the 18 years between 12 and, uh, and 30. So they're fanciful, they're mythological, and you decide for yourself whether there's any merit to them. Shanti's question was that she can recall two previous incarnations that were really, really beautiful, that she really loved, and that she really misses. And she wonders, you know, uh, what is the purpose of those? You know, can they be recalled in some way? Or what is the purpose of those kinds of feelings? Um, I think, Shanti, that uh, every one of our incarnational experiences is grist for the mill of our growth, both the beautiful experiences and the difficult experiences, and that we have to learn to harvest all of them, and that um, sometimes the memory of great past incarnations you know, are to sustain us in present vicissitude. And so to have access to all of the data means we're more prepared to deal with present circumstances than if we only had access to some of the data so the the more you can uh, the more you can access the good and the difficult in your past life the more you can discover what your strengths are that you have managed to overcome the difficult times and you've managed to uh, process and grow through the good times so there is no past incarnation which is not important to you um, and although we long for the happy times you know it's important for us that we learn from the happy times and we learn as well from the more difficult incarnations. And that wherever you find yourself in this incarnation, uh, can you appreciate and can you build into this present timeline the joy and the sense of fulfillment that was part of the happy incarnations? And can you put a smile on your face at times in this incarnation when you feel like a grimace instead? Yeah. Denise's question is, is it possible to have parallel uh, incarnations, one of being one of being on planet Earth in this uh, 3D density and one being off planet or in a different dimension? I would say absolutely yes. I would say, for instance, that for more advanced souls, you know, they're, they're able to juggle a lot more balls than the rest of us. And that the ability to simultaneously inhabit radically different environments, you know, and to be able to learn from both. It reminds me of, let's say, on planet Earth, somebody who's simultaneously a brilliant mathematician and a, a, a brilliant um, a musician. You know, they can just sit in front of a piano, piano and play Tchaikovsky and at the same time get into uh, quantum mechanics and, you know, solve equations, you know, so that the, the ability, this, what there's something called polymath, a polymath being a person who's uh, developed lots of different skill sets. I think my favorite example of that would have to be Leonardo da Vinci. You know, Leonardo was so multifaceted. Uh, he was, the, in some senses, the ultimate polymath. You know, who had, he created drawings that 500 years later would become helicopters and submarines, literally helicopters and submarines. So that he had the ability to somehow, through his imagination or to, through time travel, to do diagrams. And those diagrams are available to us right now. And at the same time, be the ultimate sculptor and the brilliant artist, you know, painter that he was. And so if we have polymaths on planet Earth, you know, who in, in the course of a single incarnation in one space suit can be that diversified in their talents, I have no doubt whatsoever that there are 
cosmic polymaths who can simultaneously have parallel lifetimes in extra dimensional kinds of realities as well as on planet Earth. Andrea's question, several questions built into it, beginning with something that we spoke about this morning, now of kind of the trajectory of the storytelling from no story to stories that crucify to stories that liberate to no story again. And then the second question had to do with the festivals, you know, uh, from different uh, religious traditions and the the sacredness of particular times of the year. So let me treat of those independently of each other. Uh, so the notion of story, uh, no story, uh, difficult story, crucifying story, liberating story, no story. Um, the Jesus figures get to a place where they don't need to tell stories for themselves because they're so in touch with and unified with ultimate reality that stories are like a kind of a, a simplistic analysis of a cosmic reality. So in order to kind of um, articulate a reality in ver ver verbally, you have to kind of brutalize it. And I was saying that this morning about the notion of, of language, the difference between referent, signified, and signifier. And so stories are, are using signifiers and they're dependent upon signified, which are dependent upon reference, where there's no guarantee whatsoever that the, uh, the signified in the mind actually represents the referent in the real world. So any story is going to be a really, really leaky vessel. And so for many reasons, we have to learn to transcend stories. But that stories become important for us, you know, in the baby steps of walking through an incarnation and trying to understand the life situation for which we've incarnated. So uh, it becomes really important then that we have some stories. Now, when you get to the stage of a Jesus, Jesus doesn't need stories but he's constantly telling stories. Because if your function is to be a teacher, um, you have to have uh, a quiver full of arrows, meaning stories, for people who need stories still. If Jesus is with a group of people who don't need stories, they're going to be joined by their silence. If Jesus is with people who need stories, they're going to be joined by the storyteller. And so, as I said, I think maybe yesterday or Sunday, uh, the, really, the real function of a storyteller is to allow you or enable you to hitch your wagon into your imagination. Yeah? So you can transcend, you know, the sensory input of what your ears are telling you. And then you can voyage off on your own. So the storyteller, the great storyteller, is not going to fill in all of the details. The great storyteller is going to give you a generic, entertaining outline that you're going to ride with and visit with, you know, and fill in for yourself. I know you're going to use, you're going to have use the other senses, you know, which haven't been act activated by just listening to it. And as well as that, you're going to use your intuition and you're going to hit a ride on your soul and you're going to kind of uh, ride on your imagination. And so you're going to visit realms. So the, 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 the Jesuses don't need stories for themselves, but they need stories in order to awaken other people to the place where they too don't need stories. But in the meantime, you have to tell them stories that kind of stretch them, you know, um, out of their comfort zone. And that's one of the functions of a cosmology. And as I said this morning, you know, stories are just a different word for a cosmology. And the functions of a cosmology are fourfold. That inadequate cosmology or inadequate story should make, make, my, make my soul sing. That's the first reason for it. Secondly, it must stretch me out of my comfort zone. Thirdly, it has to be able to accommodate every experience I have. So any, as I said this morning, there must be leaves and spiders in any adequate cosmology. If your cosmology can't account for spiders and leaves and extraterrestrials, you know, it's an incomplete cosmology. So it has to be able to account for every experience you have, you know. And then uh, fourthly, it has to be constantly revised on the basis of new experiences being generated by your by your living. And so stories have to do the same thing. Stories have to continually evolve. Make your soul sing, stretch your, your uh, comfort zone, accommodate all the data of your experience and uh, be continually updated. So that's my kind of response to the story piece of what you said. So the second part of your question had to do with the, the ways in which different uh, cultures and traditions honor you know, um, the, the, the cycles of, of, of planet Earth. And it's very, very true that there are there are cycles within cycles within cycles. So, for instance, 
in some senses, every breath you take is a new lifetime. You know, every breath you take, you're literally exchanging molecule, millions of molecules of matter with your environment. So every breath is reincarnation. Every time you wake up in the morning, you're a new person. It's a different incarnation. You shed literally billions of, of cells of self and exchange them with others and borrowed from others, including from plant life and from other human life. You know, the kind of the week is a kind of an artificial a kind of a, a birthing. A, a week is not um, a, a kind of a, a cosmological reality. We have to make up what determines that a week consists of seven days. Why not eight days or 15 days or whatever? So where as a day is a natural cycle because of the sunlight, and a year is a natural cycle because we go, we circumambulate the sun. And a moon is a is a natural cycle because on the course over the course of 29 days, you know, it comes back into the same place in the heavens. Um, in a 22,650 year cycle, uh, the um the constellations in our in our in our immediate area reconfigure themselves and we see the same constellation that people who lived 26,500 years ago. So there's this mega. Uh, the Milky Way galaxy is circumambulating a black hole in a kind of in a in a, a circulation of uh, millions of years of time. So there's cycles within cycles within cycles, and so the indigenous populations understood that, and they tied their celebrations of life to particular formats. And so I can speak most strongly from the Celtic tradition, and in the Celtic tradition there are four great times of the year. You know, when the veil between the mystical and the mundane is diaphanous. And the first one we call Imbolc, which is the 1st of February. And it's the feast of a great Irish saint called Saint, uh, saint Bridget, uh, a goddess and a, a, and a Christian saint at the same time. And the second one in Gaelic is the 1st of May, and we call it Bialtana. Yeah, And it's a time when the fairy folk are particularly active in Ireland. Uh, the third one is the 1st of August, and we call it Lunasa in Gaelic. And then the fourth one is at the 31st of October or the 1st of November, and we call it Samhain. And for the Celts, the year begins with Samhain. The year begins at the beginning of the darkness. And for the next six months, we're living in the fertile, fecund womb of darkness. That darkness is not this uh, evil void. It is the it is the womb which is capable of conceiving and carrying and giving birth, and then the birthing happens six months later, uh, with um, with Bialtana. and so for the Celts, the year begins in darkness and then transitions into light. So light is a product of darkness, not just an enemy of darkness, and the same thing of the day. And for the Celts, the day begins at sunset. Yeah. And then so the first part of the day is the dark womb that gives birth to the light when the sun rises the other side. And for the Jews, that was exactly the same. For Judaism, the day begins at sundown. And so when you're reading the Gospels particularly, you have to know that. Otherwise, the whole story about the crucifixion of Jesus doesn't make a lot of sense when you try to tie it to the, to the uh, Hebrew calendar. It doesn't make sense when we think that the day begins with sunrise. And so in many, many systems then, they're watching the natural world and the natural cosmos. And they're, they're, they're plugged in and they're kind of in sync with those cycles, the minor cycles and the major cycles. So different traditions then uh, will have different kind of terminology for it. And we'll tie it, you know, some to a daily cycle, some to the menstrual cycle of a monthly cycle for a woman particularly, her very body you know, is in is in sync uh, with the movement of the moon. And so at various stages of this complexity, you know, there are cycles which are inviting us into a different dance with reality. In, in bulk, we spell it I-M-B-O-L-C. The second one is Bialtana. It's often mispronounced in English as Beltane. Yeah, but in Gaelic, it's Biao, B E A L T A I N E, Bialtana. And it literally means Baal's fire. Mm -hmm. So it's an ancient, 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 even before the Celtic. So Baal in Hebrew means the master, master of. So the master of fire. And so the sun is, in some senses, the ultimate fire for us. So Bialtana is the master of fire. And um, it becomes very, very important. Now, you mentioned some other feast days. In between these four major feast days, if you count, these are 
um, uh, three months apart. These four uh, pieces are three months apart. Between any two of those, after six weeks, there's a midpoint. And in that midpoint, there's another celebration in the Catholic system. So when you take, for instance, between Bialtana and Lunasa, between the 1st of May and the 1st of August, there is midsummer. So uh, it's uh, typically it's around the middle of June for us. And it's called Bonfire Night. And as a kid growing up, uh, every village would have this huge, big communal bonfire. And there'd be music and dancing and all kinds of stuff around bonfire. And it's actually tied in. So the, um, the Christian churches borrowed that. And when they created the birth story for Jesus and for John the Baptist, they borrowed that. So the feast of, um, of John the Baptist is um, uh, the middle of June. Uh, and the thinking was that John came to announce Jesus. And uh, John's claim was in the Gospels, you know, um, I, must, I must decrease and he must increase. And so at the beginning, in June, John is June and he's decreasing. From June on, you know, you're entering into autumn and then into winter. And then in the, on the winter solstice is the birth of Jesus. And from Jesus on, it's getting lighter and lighter and lighter. So he must increase and I must decrease. So the Christian church has last on, latched onto these uh, Celtic and pagan kinds of uh, uh, ceremonies, and they attach then a Christian kind of uh, mythology to that. And so many, many, many of the great uh, 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 mystical sites of Europe that are meant to be kind of uh, pilgrimage sites uh, for Christianity were all Celtic and all pagan uh, worship sites. So they are impregnated with the worship of the goddesses very often and of the gods. And now the Christian church is trying to somehow attach itself to that you know, and draw energy and uh, kind of uh, from that. And as well to convince people who are grown up in the older system, you know, this is just a kind of a, a new version of the old system, nothing to be feared about here, you know. We're not, a, we're not destroying your tradition. We're kind of in, in, incorporating it into a bigger version. And so that very often has been the kind of the journey of uh, more technologically savvy religious systems to adopt and sometimes, you know, um, ex kind of extract the old wisdom and incorporate it into the, the new versions. And so what happens, you know, when uh, soulmates who are using the solace of their connection as soulmates to compensate for the nostalgia and the loss of home and connection to source. So now at least we have some temporary way of ameliorating the sadness that we feel because we've separated from God in some senses. And we're using this bond to sustain each other. And now one of the soulmates dies. And now you don't have that kind of a, a partner walking with you through the darkness of, of uh, uh, the planet. So how do you resist the temptation then for giving up in some senses? And that becomes then the major portion of the journey of the surviving soulmate. And as I said, maybe yesterday or the day before, that part of the lesson that Arlen and I signed up for was to have the experience of being many, many times in many incarnations, either um, kept apart or torn apart. And being torn apart can happen in many different ways. It can be like uh, a forced separation by outside agents, or it can be the death of one party. And so, um, and the reason that we signed up for it was that I can speak only for myself here, that I was being invited to the realization that until I needed God even more than I needed Arlen, that I wouldn't be enlightened. And that if I really wanted to kind of hasten my journey and speed up the evolutionary process for my soul, I needed to volunteer uh, for, on many times to be separated from her or to be forcibly separated by some kind of configuration so that the longing was so intense that if I could now translate that longing and say, when you need connection with God as badly as you need connection with Arlen, then you'll be enlightened. And so I, I, I agreed to it, to accept that many times. And so... You find your friend in a situation now where the spouse is dying, where a soulmate is dying, and the temptation is, can I give up on life? You know, what is the point right now? Everything I've cherished and loved and worked for is gone. Why would I continue? You know, and I would say why you would continue is that 
that that remaining partner is learning at, at a grievous cost what it is like to miss a partner so badly, you know, that you can barely face uh, tomorrow. What if you felt the same way about your separation from God? How would that uh, kind of uh, affect and modify your spiritual journey? How would it accelerate your journey back to God if you could um, arouse that same level of longing and nostalgia for source?